Hi there, I am Timur Sol and this is a new crash course video for Arkin Forge. Um, in this video, I'll show you the basics of the new Arkin Forge stable build version 4.1.150. Uh, by the time you will be watching this video, the dig it's after the last dot, so that 150 will surely change, but the core functionalities should be the same. Um, for your convenience, there's going to be a small widget that I have in the video that shows you what I'm doing with my mouse and some basic keyboard shortcuts that I use, um, just so that you know how things look like uh, on my end. And one more thing, please note that this video is slowed down and I will be trying my best to speak slowly and understandable so that everything is clear for the viewer. Let's, without any ado, uh, hop into the tutorial video. Once you launch Arkin Forge, you will be greeted by a gray screen with the new UI. Here you can open or create new maps. You can basically start making your map exactly here, but to keep things in order, I suggest making sure you get a name for your map first. One of the first things you should do is, in my opinion, poke around the main screen of Arkin Forge and see what is where. All menus are collapsible now, so they don't take up space on your screen. The widgets that are on the top of the screen are customizable, as most of the things in this software. If you go to settings, you'll also find some core functionalities for your map. Everything is pretty clear and well described, so you shouldn't have issues with understanding what does what. You can set your UI size, the colors of your map, the quality of assets, open the hotkeys menu or pick some defaults that you like. The things that you see on the screen now are mostly settings that I use as they are set but it's good to get accustomed with them before using the software. While most people use the square grid as a basic option for maps they make in Arkin Forge, you can also utilize the hex or ISO versions. I will change the map's background to black and the grid to gray variant, as it's a bit easier for my eyes. In the general map menu, you can create a new map open an old one, save it, or save the same map but under a new name. Core functionalities when it comes to cartography are in the map building menu. A new asset picker is implemented and it's much more convenient than the old one. Starting with terrain assets, we have three basic ways of placing them on the map. Usually we will use what, we, what is called the tile placement, that is placement that fills the cells of our grid. Second, we have the brush tool. This is used mostly as a filler or blender. It comes in two variants, soft and hard, and you can see the differences on the screen. And we also have the polygon tool, where you create a multi-point shape. All those are movable and use a layering system that allows you to put one on top of another. You can also replace any asset with a different asset if you want, while preserving the initial input method used. A polygon tile will remain a polygon tile.
If you made a mistake while deciding which asset should go where, you can always go to the layering menu and move the problematic asset down or up. You can also decide to send it all the way to the top or bottom of the layering stack. We will talk a bit more about the layering stack and other options and ways to do this during this video. Pushing delete will remove the thing currently selected. Any asset, be it a tile, line or object, can be snapped to grid. The default hotkey for that is control. Objects are usually placed as singular objects, but can also be brushed on or can be designated to occupy a given space. You rotate an object by grabbing the rotation handle and you resize it by grabbing the side handles or the corner handles. The rotation by default happens around the central point of the asset, but if you hold shift you will be able to move the pivot for rotation. To randomize the asset you want to put down on the map, you can multi-select assets from the asset picker. Do that by either holding control while selecting, or alternatively, select one asset, hold shift, and select another one somewhere down the line. All between the first and the last one will be selected. If you decide you want to use the object tile option, you will get a neatly ordered set of objects, each in their row, depending on their density. The object brush tool works similarly as the terrain brush, but the key component here is the density of those objects that you choose. The object brush and the object tiled placements are both great ways to create forests, bushes and so on. You can brush on assets multiple times on the same place, making the space denser with objects. Or you can select the density for them in the menu. Shift is also the default hotkey for us to randomize placement. This does force the asset you use to get a slight variation in all base transformation options, color, rotation or size. I'll put a more visually appealing object on the map so we can see some more things we can do with them now. Basic asset manipulation can be done using the handles on the sides and corners. 
These are also adjustable now, by the way, so you can have a different color of those. You can also use the transforms menus for some fine tuning and specific modifications that need pixel precision. The transformation menu updates live when you change anything with the handles. Using Ctrl-C and Ctrl-V allows us to copy assets and paste them, as in any other piece of software. Now we'll put some more stuff on the map so we get to see how some other functions work. Sometimes rotating and adjusting the size of an object after its placements can be tedious. For this reason, you can use the R and E buttons. While holding them, scroll your mouse button to change the size or rotation. This saves a lot of time, especially if you're using the same asset over and over but want a variation. Commonly done when you're trying to build heaps of rocks or heaps of wood or any other heap of something. We'll get back to these logs, but for now, let's find another object to show you how the light system works. Each object can be a light source. To see the light source better, we'll change the day of time. I have my day of time widget up on the top of the screen, but if you decide you don't want it to be there, just go to map tools and time of day. Changing the light color and brightness is easy and done by a universal color picker. You can also create directional lanterns and such by changing the field of view number. Most Arkham Forge assets come with a shadow and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Arkham Forge allows you to use a chroma key which can be used to create amazing effects like actual holes in the materials or other things that you have, or create unique blending effects. The tent here has holes in the roof, and I'm using the chroma key here to make sure that what is below is actually visible through the holes.
I'll copy the tent asset to make a side-by-side -side comparison between the original asset and a modified one, since we're talking about different color options. But first, you probably noticed that there's a floating menu above the asset when you place it down. The menu here is used as shortcuts to most of the commonly used asset manipulations that you will find. For example, if I select the color manipulation menu, it will pop up on the left side and I won't need to open it manually. The same menu where we have our chroma key is the menu where we can set our hue, saturation, light data, as well as change the tint. Let's clear up the tents using Dell to get rid of them. I'll change the time of day to night so I can show you some more things with the light options here. There are a few more ways in which you can bring more light to your map. You saw how I used the tent earlier to turn the object into a source of light. But not only objects can be light bearers. You can put a standalone light wherever you want by right clicking on the map and simply selecting that option. The customization menu allows you to change things with the light just as before. You can even animate it later, even if it's not a part of the map per se. There's one thing here that I like you to notice. You are not limited to full numbers here. You can easily put something like 0.1 or 0.342. Standalone lights have the icon that is only visible for you as the GM during the build. If you don't like how it looks like, you can make it transparent with the opacity slider. The standalone light placement is also available in the map building menu if you want. Finding the right amount of light and the right type of light takes time, so don't be frustrated if you don't get it perfect for the first time. So just to reiterate, standalone lights are very easy to position and manipulate, just remember where you put them. The floating menu allows you to also quickly lock or unlock any asset. If you lock an asset but need to grab it later, you can hold shift to do that. Because I'm starting to have a lot of things on the map, I'll lock everything by selecting the whole map and using the shortcut menu to lock everything selected. Let's go back to daytime and change the background to something else. Since I lock the whole map, simply clicking won't do. I need to click while shift is held. I'm searching for something more consistent that will have a clearer texture. Also, notice the little mouse and keyboard widget on the corner and how I click without any effect. That's because the previous texture is locked. Just as a reminder, you can replace any asset with any other asset. I'm replacing a texture with another texture, so the swap will be seamless. Swapping a texture with an object might have very different effects. Since I'm already here, I'll drop a small backpack here, but I'll use it a little bit later. For now, it's worth seeing how clear the shadow under the assets are. Since we're having a proper background now, Let's just see the standalone light placement that you can pick from the side menu. It's pretty cool because you have a way to dynamically see how things change on your map with this tool. I'll go to the map building, lights menu, and now my cursor is shedding light. If I click, this will put the light down just like the right click placement earlier. 
editing the source of light is as easy as previously. The map building tool has also a barrier tool that blocks light. It works as a simple polygon line, left click to put down a point, right click to end drawing. These lines are selectable and you can manipulate them during the build. These barriers are not the only way to block light. I'll pick one of those logs and move it on top of the layering system, so it's above the tent. Notice that it does not block light at all. If I'd like to make it a barrier, I can simply go into Customize, Blocking, and select the Blocks Light option. Some core Arkenforge items, like most walls, usually have the option on by default. Worth noticing here, the barriers prevent light from passing it, but they do not cast shadows per se. Setting up two light sources next to something will not create a double shadow effect. And speaking about that, Let's focus on shadows for a second. Since you are in the dark, they won't be clearly visible. Let's fix that. I'll shift the time of day to noon and unlock the item. Notice how the shadow actually moves in the proper direction. It's not glued to one side of the object, but it is properly on one side where the shadow would actually fall. A feat that is worth noticing here is the fact that it is actually connected with the time of day. The shadow gets longer or shorter. The ambient light is also adjustable, so it doesn't always have to be regular sun type yellow. This might bring interesting results if you're building a crystal cavern or something like that. If you want to build a map with elongated shadows to give a more ominous atmosphere, you can do that also in the time of day menu, where you can set the map tone for shadows. Fair warning. Overdoing it will most probably look very fake. Now to the layer stack. Notice how the log I'm manipulating is above some and below other objects. It's on the object layer, so it will never be below the terrain, but its position in relation with other objects is dependent on when I set the acid down. You might have noticed this earlier that there's an option to move a selected object below or under another object. This works as written. You technically have to have one object in your selection, choose to send it above or below, and click another one. Remember, if you locked your asset earlier, you will either need to unlock them or shift click to make it work.
I will make a slight mess with the backpack under and between the logs to show you the above below object setting. By selecting one asset and choosing move above or move below, I'm no longer forced to click move one above a hundred of times. I just need to know where I want the asset to be. Working with locked and unlocked assets is key when it comes to good workflow, so it's worth accustoming yourself with it. The locked asset panel works as previously, so you have a list of things you can lock or unlock if you want to work with a whole set of things, like for example, lock all walls. If you ever need to check if something is locked or not, a default hotkey for that is Alt. In the map tools, you'll also find the map rotation, which rotates the whole screen, including the grid, bookmarks that allow you to create points on the map that are relevant to gameplay, the missing assets panel, and the map info lists with some other useful things. Now speaking of walls, the line tool did not change much, though there are some new things that you can add to it. You got your basic line tool. Works well if you hold control to snap it to a grid. Keep the widget in the corner of the screen in mind and notice how I utilize the control button to snap the line elements to the grid. Each basic line will have three points that you can manipulate. two at the edges, and one in the middle. Usually you will use the edges to prolong the line and the middle to form curves. I'll delete the previous lines and make another one. This time it will be a small creek-like line around the statue. Before placing a line asset down, you can change its width to fit your needs. Thanks to the fact that the asset in question hovers in your hand or cursor, you can fine-tune its width before you commit to anything. You can also obviously fix anything after you got your asset on the ground already, but in my opinion, it's better to measure twice and cut once than the other way around. I'll make this creek using the polygon line tool. Every time I click, there's a new reference point created. You'll learn not to overdo it with time. If you got too many points, you'll notice that the line texture breaks in a very strange way. Too few points will not give you a natural curve of sorts. Because the asset is very bright, you don't see the points I'm talking about immediately. So let's change that. We'll change the color and brightness using the customized color menu. Remember, I could also access this using the colorful icons hovering on the screen when the asset is selected. Now you can see the dozens of points created. 
they are all updatable and you can move the whole thing as a regular asset. There is also the circle line tool, which has its uses. You can form things that surround other assets as well as circle or platforms or whatever else you need. The circle line is easy to manipulate as other assets, but it doesn't have manipulation points and it is not easily made bigger or smaller. I'll put one such circle around our creepy altar for later use. If after placement you decide there's an issue with your line width, you can go into customization and open the line menu. This is there only if you have the line selected. You don't need to use the slider if you'd rather use specific numbers. Besides the line width, you will find a new tampering option. But to show you how it works, I'll need another line somewhere. The tampering works from 0 to 100, and if you go all the way to 0, it will give you a spike-like apparition. Be careful not to crunch your line too much though. Take note of how the line looks now, and how it will look like in a second when I make it longer. To show you the next line option, we'll need yet another line set down on our map. This will also be done only after you have the line already in place, similarly as to when we did uh, with the direct point manipulation with the river before a minute or two. You can both remove and add line points to a polygon line, not a straight line though. And there's also the reverse points option that is also in the line customization menu. It works great with lines that have a clear direction, like cliffs or perspective walls. If you click that option, it will simply reverse the direction of the wall that it is facing. The map is becoming a bit too chaotic for my taste, so I'll remove the light and barriers from the statue. To do so, I could either select them one by one or drag select. The drag select does however select other things on the map. Here besides the barriers, I grab the statue and the circle or lava near the altar, and also the two textures. If I click the small text near the currently selected items, I'll instantly get the layer stack open in the left panel. It shows me what I currently have selected. 
I could now select one of these items if I wanted, but that would deselect the others here. So instead, I will hold my control key and click on the items that I'm not interested in. So the angel statue and the two terrain elements. This leaves the barriers in my current selection. The layer stack is something brand new in Arkenforge. While it doesn't offer a layer system like Photoshop, it does now have a stack indication that can work pretty well if you learn how to read it. Bottom line, it's just a list of things you got on your map with a proper ID set to it. Things are divided into terrain and object layers. The lines that appear when you hover an object or anything else on the list indicate where the object is on the map, pointing towards the center. You can also hover above the miniature to see a thumbnail. Similarly as the line, there are some options involved with tiles. I'll use a tile polygon to put a new texture down on the map and move it a few layers lower. Notice that the polygon tile has a very similar point reference system like the polygon line, but there's an important difference. While you can transform a line after you made it, you won't be able to change the shape of a polygon. At least not yet. It's pretty possible that in the future update, something like this will be added. Okay, so now that I got my polygon there, I'll push it a little bit lower below the Fox River. If I go into customization options, now I'll find a new menu there called Tile. Here I can change some aspects of the texture. But there's not much to talk about here. The tile scale will change how much we zoom in or zoom out of the texture itself, while the tile rotation will just rotate it. The scale takes some time to understand. The number that you see here is texture dependent. By default, it's 100 divided by the texture width. If you use a texture square that has a width of 256 pixels, the basic core value of the scale here will be 39.06, because the slider multiplies the whole things by 100 for ease of use. The tile noise settings adds blank spots that are great for blending terrain together. I seldom use only one texture like here now. Uh, usually I blend at least three together with tile noise. An important thing here to remember is while Arkenforge does not have a Photoshop layer system, it does have levels, which can also be utilized. Using the shortcut hovering menu, I'll push the terrain layer to level 1. Now it is above everything else because it's physically on the higher level. I can always revert that later. The option to move levels is also in the layering menu or in the widgets. Inside the layering menu, you can see on what level you currently are, and the same goes for the widget on top. If you decide to utilize the levels while you're map making or playing, check out the settings for layers. They will, without doubt, make your experience more robust. Things like half transparency or casting shadows are all interesting options. I'll quickly click through all of them to show you how they work. To see how to cast shadows from higher levels functions, uh, we'll need to send an angel statue or something else up one level and get back down. It looks like the angel is missing now, but notice the subtle shadow down here, uh, cast by the things that are above.
The semi-transparent feature is a great option when you have multi-leveled battle maps and want to give a clear indication about things being higher while staying at the same level as earlier. The last option here makes the whole object layer disappear, leaving only things that are on the terrain layer. Now, let's see some more things that we can do with objects. First, we have to pick one though. So let's go to our asset picker and find something suitable. One of the unique features of Arkham Forge is the fact that you can technically animate anything. Mostly, we will work with what we call objects, so I'll start with them. I'll use a corpse as example here. By the way, notice how the object seemingly hovers in the air because of the shadow. That's an effect of my earlier manipulations with the general time of day and shadow menu. I'll need to turn that off. Okay, go into the effects menu and now look at the menu. Each type of asset has a different set of things we can do with it. For example, an object can blink, very useful for alarm lights. An object can also float. And there's a variety of ways to utilize it, from water-based assets to planetoids in the sky. There's a pulse animation that forces the object to sort of jump. There are also two rotation options, around the pivot and around the center. Now, because we are technically fiddling with the X and Y position of the object, there may be some issues with how the object is displayed. The animations are stackable, which is pretty amazing when you're building machines or other wacky stuff. I'll delete all effects and rotate the corpse back. Because I moved the pivot, I'll need to reset it to make it work normally as intended.
Now let's see one or two light animations. I'll change the singular light here to be more bright so we see what I'm doing and go back to the effects tab in a minute. Over here you will see some familiar animations like shake, but also light blink and light flicker options. These two are unique for light sources and give you a glitchy or a campsite feel. Lines also have their own effect, the line scroll. You won't find others here though, so for now there's no shake, pulse or anything else. The scroll effect does however apply to all types of lines. It basically rolls the texture you use for the line infinitely. You can do the same thing with tiles. Here I'll just make a random blob of magma. Obviously it will sit below the objects. After it's on the map, I'll add a tile scroll effect. You can control the speed and direction of the flow. Stacking a few layers of similar textures with tile noise and a subtle scroll has proven to be an amazing tool. Besides options that we saw until now, it's worth checking out the less used but also valid options that you got in the menu. The grid scaler, the selection tool or the blocking options. Just a small reminder here that while Arkenforge is a fantastic map making tool, it is first and foremost an in-person VTT. This means that you can plan your maps and play them in person using Arkenforge to make it more immersive. So if you're planning to use it uh, in your gaming cavern, you will most probably want to use the fog of war and other options for items or tokens to see in the darkness uh, or ahead of them. Different types of vision or light can be used here for that purpose. To show you one such way of utilizing light to make a token, and in this case it's just an object, see in the dark, I'll pick something smaller, like a metal helmet. I'm a bit hesitant in this video because I was wondering whether I shouldn't pick something more obvious, but let's just roll with what I have for now. I'll turn the light on for the helmet and you'll see an immediate effect. I remind you that we're having a fog of war option on right now.
If you set the light source to a dark color with the shine through fog option on, it will in fact dissipate the fog of war. That is, if you have the fog of war on, obviously. Because there is no other light source here on the map, the only thing that we will barely see is the light that makes uh, the fog of war dissipate. The video right here is pretty dark, but without the token vision, it would be nearly pitch black. This emulates an effect like dark vision. If I would make the light dark yellow, it would create an effect like a small torchlight. Notice how the contours of the cliffs appears from the fog of war here. I could also do something similar during daytime, and only that what the token actually sees would be discovered. And speaking of visibility, I'll go back to daytime and quickly go to the main settings menu. You might remember us being here in the beginning when we were setting up the grid to be light gray and the background to be black. If you are having a hard time seeing the options, the accessibility menu in settings gives you an option to fiddle with the size of the UI. You will need to see what's interesting for you and what's not. For example, I don't use any sound options for my builds, but they may be crucial for yours. Just so that you know though, display allows you to pick resolutions and default screens that you want to use. Grid, we've already seen earlier. The hotkeys menu is one that I definitely recommend checking out somewhere in the beginning of your mapping adventures. I do half of what I do nowadays with shortcuts. The map settings have a couple of things that are worth checking out if you expect some different core behavior and so on. Generally speaking, all these options are adjustable and you should know they exist just in case. I rarely do things nowadays by going all the way to the left dock, uh, just because we have the hotkeys, but also we have the little hovering menu that I talked about a little bit earlier. You'll notice that there's an additional shortcut here that looks like a lightning bolt. We didn't use it in this video, but in general, it allows you to have any left hand sidebar panel that you need uh, to be accessible at a click. Notice that on the top left of the sidebar, there's an identical lightning icon. If I'd click it, I'd add a shortcut to the menu for every asset. Pretty neat. Sometimes you'll probably need to go into the content library to handpick something or check where stuff is. It's all roughly a folder system, so there's not much to talk about here. If you'd like to use one of these assets here, you drag it on the map instead of clicking. A fun thing to do while you're having an asset like this selected, or to be fair, any other asset, is to change how it is placed. So even though I have the foreign root asset as a singular object here, if I change the placement type, it will change how it is placed from now on. Another example. I select the tent, which is an object, but now I change the placement type to tile, and all of a sudden I can make a tent tiled texture. Now 
there's a lot of things happening on this rather unfortunate but workable map. As I clean it up a bit, I'd like to point out the grouping widget here. This allows me to make assets connected. If I do something with one, the rest will be selected as well. Since I locked them earlier, I will need to shift click to select them. After I click the group option here, they are all now connected. A fun thing to do with the layer stack here is to deselect some assets while they are grouped by holding control and left clicking on them. If I just click, they would select them all again because they are grouped. Another thing is when you're searching for a specific object or a specific thing that you have on your map. You can force the camera to move to that object. Right click also allows you to manipulate the general layer stack here. And again, as with previous versions, if you want to modify a group of items, you can do so. And if you want a size modification to occur at the center of each individual asset, you can hold shift while doing it and it will work like a charm. The last thing that we will do here is simply export what we did as a file. Arkenforge allows you to export these maps as a single image or in various pre-made ways that are meant for other VTT services. One is very notably distinct, a module version for Foundry, which basically carries all the walls and light settings uh, to your Foundry game. You can also alternatively use the UVTT file for doing that. There's also an export to video option if you'd like. Just be sure to understand that while the video will be full HD, uh, for enormous map it will be not super sharp just because of the resolution limit. I'll export the map as a simple JPEG now. Click on export map, select what you want to export and start the process. This will bring a prompt as to where I want the map to be saved. And I guess that's it folks. Um, this video is basically everything packed uh, that you can do with Arkenforge. Well, not everything, because Arkenforge is very, very uh, layered, I'd say. So there's a lot of things that I don't use that other people use a lot, like the sounds, the URIs, um, the uh, field of view, and things that I don't use for my map making, but other people uh, use a lot, a lot. Um, 
if this video gave you uh, like a feel that you might want to try out Arkham Forge, there's a free trial of Arkham Forge that lasts for like one month. So you can basically test out everything in the tool uh, without any any um, drawbacks and without any financial um, commitments. Um, and you do have the full tool. There's like there's no limit to what what it what it does in the trial version. So uh, I do encourage you to test it out if you have not. And if you already have the tool, I do also encourage you to go to the official Arkham Forge tutorials uh, YouTube channel and check the official tutorials where you see step by step how you can do different things. I'm not focusing on core aspects like a tutorial video um, in this channel. I will only make some tips, tricks, and this general showcase that you see, uh, that you saw right now. Um, I guess that's it for now. If you're interested in world building and map making, I hope you would check out my other videos, especially the uh, Cartography 101. Um, I'm pretty proud of it, uh, and I think it does give a good insight on how to get into digital cartography and digital map making. That's all from me now. Uh, my name is Timur Sol. Uh, I hope to see you around and bye.